All right. I'm going to go ahead and go. Welcome everyone to the Brooklyn Book Fest panel. Raise your voice as part of the YA Out Loud series with three brilliant authors, Randy Colbert, Kim Johnson, and Marie Liu, here to discuss authoritarianism, voting rights, and the American justice system in an important conversation about power, privilege, and teens getting political. That is a lot. So we have a conversation for the first part of this 45 minute block with time for some Q&A after, hopefully. My name is Daniel Nayeri. Uh, I am the lucky publisher of Odd Dot. It is an imprint of Macmillan Children's Publishing Group. We specialize in joyful books for curious minds. I'm also the author of this book, Everything Sad is Untrue, an autobiographical novel about my family's escape from Iran as refugees. But uh, that's the last you'll hear about me. This panel isn't about that. It is about our brilliant trio. Brandy Colbert, I want to start with you. We're going to go alphabetical for the intros. If it's all right, I'm going to read that bio uh, that I found online. You can feel free to audit it. And then I have a question for you. We're going to do the same um, for your colleagues. So Brandy Colbert is the award-winning author of Little and Lion, Quant and Finding Yvonne, and the forthcoming The Revolution of Bertie Randolph. Her short fiction and essays have been published in several critically acclaimed anthologies for young people. She is on the faculty at Hamline University's MFA program in writing for children and lives in Los Angeles. Welcome, Brandy. Can you tell us a little bit about your book? Of course, it's just come out, The Voting Booth. Um, and We'll start with a little bit of, uh, you know, intertextuality, as the kids like to say. Um, tell me, what book is your book talking to? Oh, what book is my book talking to? Oh, gosh, I'm totally caught off guard by this. Uh, well, I no problem. Take your time and, and <laughs> tell me just a little bit uh, about the book first. It starts uh, on voting day of a particularly important national election. Yeah, you can imagine what that feels like. Um, so the, <laughs> <laughs> the Voting Booth is my latest uh, YA novel. It came out in July. Um, it is about two teens, um, Marva and Duke. They meet on election day. Uh, the book is all set set all in one day. Um, so they meet at the polls. Uh, Marva has been ready for this her whole life. Like she's super into voting, has been um, you know campaigning for her ideal candidate. And um, after she votes, she's the first in line, and she sees Duke um who has been waiting to vote behind her and he gets turned away and she's just like not having it so she goes up and completely inserts herself in the stranger's life and uh they set off on this like day-long adventure of trying to make sure that he can vote and then also sort of get wrapped up in the lives of the other voters around town and there's also um a subplot about an internet cat um eartha kitty she's right there she's great um, so that's about it. It's kind of um, the whirlwind of a day, um, some romance in there, and uh, lots of talk about voting and elections. It is. Um, I have to say, I loved it. I just, uh, I just finished it. And um, let me come back to you with that question, because you're right. Okay. It's a big one. <laughs> Thank um, you. <laughs> absolutely. And, and yeah, it's, it's really uh, not, you know, feel free we, on, without necessarily throwing shade. I love the idea when we were talking about uh, books getting political books for YA. I want, I was hoping to avoid, um, well, avoid the thought that, that, you know, like, boy, do you think teens should get political? Let's not, I didn't want to start you there. I want to start you with the opportunity to maybe talk about the, what you wanted to say to the teens. So as you're thinking about that, let me go to, uh, Kim Johnson, author of this is my America. Uh, welcome Kim. Um, Kim Johnson has held leadership positions in social justice organizations as a teen. She's now a college administrator who maintains civic engagement throughout the community while also mentoring black student activists and leaders. This is My America is her debut novel and what a doozy. Uh, it explores racial injustice against innocent black men who are criminally sentenced uh, and the families left behind to pick up the pieces. She holds degrees from the University of Oregon and the University of Maryland College Park. Kim lives her best life in Oregon with her husband and two kids. Uh, find her at CaseyJohnsonWrites.com and follow her on Twitter and Instagram at Casey Johnson Writes. Uh, welcome. Kim, tell us a little bit about This Is My America. Yeah, so This Is My America. It's my debut novel that came out this July. Um, it basically follows a 17-year-old Black girl whose father has been wrongfully incarcerated, and she writes weekly letters to Innocence X, which when you talk about um, who my book is talking to, who, who yeah. was the conversation uh, released by Brian Stevenson, the Equal Justice Initiative, 
um, and the Innocence Project. And uh, her father is in his last year of his uh, death sentence. And as she's trying to pursue justice for him, um, we see the cycle that happens all too much in real life in that her brother is then accused of killing a white girl in their community. Um, and he decides to go on the run because he's seen what has happened to his father in his wrongful incarceration. Uh, situation. And so it's a story about um, her journey to uh, find out what happened to uh, her, her brother and her father. And she's sort of a, a teen detective um, who takes her agency. It's a call to action for her. And it's definitely a, um, a story where someone's not sitting back and waiting for justice to happen, but someone who's actually fighting for justice in their voice. Absolutely. Yeah, I was editorializing in your bio. Obviously, you didn't write what a doozy uh, for your own book. I just finished. <laughs> I just finished reading it. I'm. I'm to be. I'm responsible for the claim. It's a doozy. It's a. Um, it, you're absolutely right. It's got all. Uh, all the sort of uh, drama of of that young detective had some Veronica Mars vibes. Where I'm like, don't. You're a teenager. Don't. Do not go there. Um, and of course, uh, Just Mercy. I do want to come back to Just Mercy because it does um, vibe with that. But first, let me welcome Marie. Marie Lou is the number one New York Times bestselling author of the Legend series, the Young Elites trilogy, Batman, Nightwalker, and the Warcross series. She graduated from the University of Southern California and jumped into the video game industry where she worked as an artist. Uh, a full-time writer, she spends her spare hours reading, drawing, playing games, and getting stuck in traffic. She lives in the traffic jam capital, Los Angeles, with her illustrator, author, husband, Primo Galanosa, uh, their Pembroke, Pembroke uh, Welsh Corgi, and their Chihuahua Monster mix. Welcome, Marie. Uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about Sky Hunter? Yeah, absolutely. And sorry, I'm using like a stack of the books from my laptop. <laughs> So I'm going to scoot one out. Um, Come down one unit. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this is Sky Hunter. Um, this is my latest. And um, Sky Hunter is set about 5,000 years in our future. So it's sci-fi, uh, but in like a regressed society. So our civilization has vanished, um, leaving behind a lot of ruins. And a new civilization has built on top of it. And it's about this new world where a federation has taken over pretty much every country in the world, except for one tiny country called Mara um, that's just hanging on by a thread. And the book follows uh, a girl named Talon, who is a, um, she had fled to Mara with her mother when she was a child from one of the countries that fell to the federation. And now she's one of the few elite warriors in Mara who are basically the last people standing between Mara and the Federation. Um, so the story follows her. It follows um, her job as a striker, one of these elite warriors who are tasked with fighting off um, ghosts, which are monsters that prowl the war fronts um, that are sent by the Federation. Uh, it follows her found family that she finds and her fellow soldiers. And it also follows a boy named Red, um, who she encounters um, on the war front. And Red is a prisoner of war. He uh, is a soldier who defected from the Federation, and she's not really sure what to make of him. Um, if he's an enemy that she can, that she, you know, has to fight, or if he is actually the weapon that can save them. So it's a bit of a hate to love romance. It's um, it's a bit of um, you know finding your comrades uh, in your fellow soldiers, uh, and a little bit of a mystery of what's actually happening in this world. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm, every chapter in this book ends with like a what <laughs> moment. So I'm going to let you lead me on the facts I'm allowed to say and the facts that are spoiler and we'll stay spoiler free uh, as or rather you're the author. So we'll stay exactly uh, as spoiler free as you tell me to. But it's um, there's a there's a twist a minute uh, in that in that. Uh, project. So um, thank you. Let me come back to that question because I do, this is the panel that in some ways is trying to, uh, you know, uh, to look uh, at your books through the angle of, of politics, of modern politics, uh, how you want to talk to teens um, in general. And, and so th there I begin, um, in some ways, you can reframe my question um, as, you know, what is the conversation that your book wants to have? with uh, with your reader, um, in addition to being chock-a-block with romance and uh, and plot, 
um, there is this other layer here. Um, what, uh, Kim, let me start uh, with you and then, um, then I'll bounce around a little bit. But um, I know you said uh, your book is talking to Just Mercy. Um, I thought your, um, you had in these sort of inter, uh, in chapter letters where the, um, the, the Tracy is actually writing to Innocence X, right? Writing to this organization of lawyers. Um, I love that. I thought it was such an interestingly um, accessible way of saying this is this is something that a team can do and does. It was almost like you were you were you're a, what's the word? Um, you were you were you were just showing your reader exactly how how they can sort of get involved. Was that on purpose? Is how to what extent was Just Mercy um, the book you were thinking about? And and what is the conversation you you were hoping to have? Yeah, I mean, the, the conversation um, is really to broaden out what a lot of media was focused on in 2014 and 2015 around the Black Lives Matter movement, where it was um, on very visible, horrific, uh, tragic um, representation on live video, um, usually cameras, of what happens to Black men and Black women and, and Black trans people in this country. Um, at the hands of police brutality and those that are uh, using their own policing, even though they're not represented, um, they're not an actual police officer. And I wanted to, my conversation I really wanted to bring on that really tapped into after I read Just Mercy and um, work that I've done around um, justice issues is that uh, it's just a sliver of our communal justice system and that there's larger systemic things that are going on. Um, and I wanted to be able to use the death sentence as, a, as an example of we actually have have people who are wrongfully incarcerated in this country, one in nine. Um, and if we can get that wrong, what else are we getting wrong in this country? Um, and I wanted to talk about the cycle um, of our um, criminal justice system and how once it impacts a, a parent, um, you more than likely are able to impact um, later in life the carceral state with a young with a young person for the next generation, and how that actually can impact an entire community in a, in a really tragic way. Um, and so that's really the conversation I was having. For me, I work with a lot of young people. I've been an activist since I was a young person, and um, now I'm more an amplifier. Now I'm more. I'm an administrator. I'm the man right now. <laughs> I'm working <laughs> working in higher ed, and yeah. so I'm seen as that. Um, often now because I'm older, um, but really, you know, I, I also am an advisor to undergraduate group and often they want to think about what they can do. And so in the book, I was very, very intentional with trying to show all the different ways that young people can use their voice. And a letter is, is almost the most simplest way that you can do when you don't know who to reach, how to reach who to access, um, that you can write a letter. And I really wanted to demonstrate that. And I do that in other ways too, of demonstrating things that she does on her own, like running Know Your Rights workshops. Um, she does that all on her own. She gathers the information. She uses her voice through writing um, in, uh, in her school paper. She created her own corner where she talks about justice issues, um, really think, playing on the media aspect of like, if, if you don't like what you're seeing in media and how the media is talking about your communities, that you actually can be a voice for that. So a lot of that was all sort of intentional ways to help young people think about um, where their strengths are and how they can use their voice. Absolutely. And you, um, I thought you did, you, scaffolding is the word I was looking for. I thought you scaffolded that well. Obviously, your book's going to get you cred with all the teenagers coming out. So hopefully, it won't just be the man forever. But um, <laughs> it was awesome. So that character, uh, Tracy uh, and Marva, would have either been best friends or intense rivals. Another, another uh, sort of activist. Another, another hardworking. Um, just you know, you see her in the very first uh, day of the voting. Um, uh, in the voting line, and you can already sense how much work has led up to it. Do you want to tell us a little bit about Marva and also uh, and also the conversation you were hoping to have in the voting group? Yeah, so this actually was like super obvious. Uh, I don't know why I didn't think of this immediately, but um, uh, Yes, No, Maybe So by uh, Becky Albertalli and Aisha uh -huh. Saeed. I, I think they're really great companion books. Um, I loved that book. It was all about, you know, teens um, getting out there and canvassing. And, um, you know, they went really specific in their book uh, with the candidate that they were campaigning for. And um, neither of them are 18, so they can't vote yet. So I think it's really great that, like, 
uh, in that book, they show that what you can do before you turn 18, and then you have Marva here, you know, on the first day that she can vote, <clears throat> excuse me, in the presidential election. Um, yeah, Marva's really intense. So I feel like readers probably either really hate her, really love her. Um, she's not me, but, you know, there's a little bit of me in all of my characters, I think. I think I probably lean more toward or the teenager definitely leaned more toward Duke, um, just sort of doing my, the other, uh, the co narrator in this book, just sort of doing my duty because I knew I needed to, and because I knew how important voting rights were for, you know, black, the black community in particular, um, especially having family from the Southern United States. Uh, so Marva also believes in all of that, but you know, she really believes it's her duty to get out there and make sure that literally every person she meets is able to cast a vote. And so that's how she meets Duke on the first day. He gets turned away uh, because of some registration issues. And you know, she just makes it her duty to go and help him. She doesn't really even think twice about it. She's just like, okay, you know, you need to get somewhere your car's um, broken down, let's go, like I'll take you. It's just not even a question. That's her biggest duty. So I think it, um, really the book, speaks to teens, you know, maybe two types of teens, teens who don't think they have a lot of power um, and don't know what they can do to really help change the world. And they see that maybe things are going off the rails, you know, for them and they don't know what to do. They know they can vote, but they, they really think that's it. And they haven't looked into sort of the deeper implications of that. And then, you know, there are teens like Marva who are like, oh no, like I've been doing this since I was like, you know, 13, 14, I've been, you know, um, text banking, um, sending postcards, uh, you know, phone banking, going door to door. Um, and so she knows that she can make a difference, but she wants everyone else to see that they can and kind of show them the way that they can do that too. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I, I don't think it's a spoiler to say, you know, the plot of this book revolves around one day. Um, so it's actually the shocking thing, but by the time you sit back, you sort of breathe out when you finish the book and you go, that was a lot, <laughs> that was a lot to do in one day. Um, but it's, it's very realistic. It was very, it was very much like, wow, that is what you have to do if you want to make your vote count just for just one vote. And, and Duke, of course, several times as a character, he has more leaned back. He's got more to do that day. Um, and so he he kind of just wants you, you can feel him just wanting to shrug off the responsibility just a couple times and of course marva she's not going to shrug anything off um so that was yeah. um that is i agree with you i think that is that is the central conversation um in a world where that voting didn't help anything uh and innocent and sex didn't help anybody five thousand years later boy stuff goes wrong <laughs> there's uh, the world is in ruins and and authoritarianism is, uh, has hasn't gone away. So, um, do you want to tell us a little bit, uh, Marie? I I was desperate to figure out what you had. You had these moments of ruins, and I was like, "Where is that? Is that is that St. Louis? Was that St. Louis she's describing?" Um, which is my puzzle brain taking over. But that's not the point of the ruins. The point is we messed up. Um, what what? Tell us a little bit about the that part of the the story, if you would, and the the nature of the conversation for these teens. Yeah, for sure. And um, and just just for a geographical reference, it's it's basically the Pacific Northwest, but like a thousand years in the future. Um, yeah, <laughs> so not too far off. Yeah. Um, yeah, I well, the, the original inspiration for Sky Hunter was um, back in 2016. And it was after I saw the, the 2016 Democratic National Convention and heard Mr. Khan speak about Humayun Khan, his son, um, who was a Muslim American soldier who was killed in Iraq, uh, saving his fellow soldiers. And afterwards, I just couldn't stop thinking about just the young people in this country. They're so young, you know, they're 18, going off to war, just marginalized young people from all walks of life in America, going off to war to protect us, and then and coming back to a country that doesn't give them the respect that they deserve. And so, so that was haunting me and it haunts me still. And so I think about that speech all the time. And so that was the inspiration behind Talon as a character. Um, and from, from Talon grew the rest of the world. Uh, I just started thinking about what kind of world supports a character like this, you know, 5,000 years in the future. And I, I read recently a, 
um, really great nonfiction book called Fallen Glory, The Lives and Deaths of History's Greatest Buildings, which I highly recommend. Um, it was recommended to me by Roshni Chakshi. And I, I loved it so much because it's like every chapter is like a narrative about um, some some historical structure, like uh, like the Library of Alexandria or, or Babylon or, you know, these, these ancient places that seemed at the time to be, they would be immortal. Like this was going to be around forever. And this, you know, arrogant king built a whatever thing that he was like, I am going to be remembered until the end of time. And then it just like fades away into the sands of time, you know, to become like myth and legend. Um, and I just, that, that always makes me think about like, where are we, where, really, where are we going to be in 5,000 years? You know, are we going to be those ruins and people are going to look back digging through the archaeologist, you know, archaeologists going to be like, well, oh, this library of Congress has some weird stuff in it. <laughs> and just thinking back on like what, what it was like in our time and how we thought we were so mighty and then you know and how those mighty fall so so that was that went into the world building as well and i i basically wanted to write a story that it this was like my catharsis story um since it was you know started in 2016 i just had a lot of thoughts to get out and i i and for young people um i wanted to i wanted to say that to tell them that like, I, I see you, I see the struggle that's happening in your lives right now. And the thing with young people today is that sometimes I feel like I'm, I'm sort of, I'm just dictating what I'm seeing them do. It, it is not so much that, you know, I, I try to inspire them, but I feel like they kind of inspire me. It's the other way around. Um, teens today are like going out in the streets and marching for what they believe in and fighting for huge things like climate change and gun control and all of these things that they shouldn't have to worry about, you know? Um, I feel like they should be worried about prom and grades and, you know, growing up, but that's not the way the world is. But at the same time, you know, I feel like young people have always been like this, you know, every generation's young people are, are the ones pushing that kind of, you know, pushing the next progressive movement forward. So I, I wanted to write something showing young people taking agency of this ruined world that they live in um, and the things that they face where they are not just soldiers, but, you know, anything, anyone contributing something to our society who is in turn getting racism and discrimination thrown back at them, um, but also like the, the good people in their lives. And like there are some people who will have your back and and hold those people close. Um, so it's, it's a little bit of everything. It's, it's, I, I wanted to acknowledge their rage. I wanted to acknowledge the good people that they have in their lives. Nice. Um, yeah, well, I, I, so let me, let me ask you this, uh, Brandy, I don't have a segue. I wish I had a segue, but you, you kind of, you dropped the mic. I'm sorry. Uh, Brandy, let me give, uh, so it, there's a, there's a, there's a great essay by George, uh, Orwell. Where he says he makes the claim that all art is propaganda. Right, which is which he sort of explains as being all art is trying to convince the reader of something, um, and that is my question here. Um, it's a two-parter. Um, it, you know, what would you say um, the voting booth is trying to convince the reader of? And um, did you think? Uh, did you have to think about um, about the multi-layered uh, readership in the YA business? That is to say, did you did you end up having to think about the gatekeeper versus the young reader, or did you feel like you had a straight beat to them? You were gonna, you were talking to your reader, and you were able to convince them of something. Um, it's a little bit of a two-parter. One's craft, one's publishing. Look at us; we're we're good and good for you, uh, Brandy. <laughs> you want to start us off? Yeah. Um, so with the voting booth, you know, I really just want like teens to. I think it really is speaking to teens particularly, and I really want them to think about just using their voice. I mean, really anyone can benefit from that conversation. I know adults who you know, not personally, but I see adults saying, you know, that they're not going to vote or they don't agree with the, um, the two party system. And that also comes up in the book because Marva's boyfriend, um, you know, the book opens is like just kind of a privileged guy who like, she thinks he gets sort of the things that are going on uh, for communities that he doesn't belong to. But then when it ultimately comes down to it, he's like, but yeah, I'm not going to vote because, you know, I don't agree with this two party system. Like my vote's not going to make a difference and all of this. And she's just like, Oh my God, <laughs> like, I can't believe you're my boyfriend. Um, so yeah, I think it's just really the importance of, of voting. I've come across 
you know, like I said, not people in my life have actually gotten into fights with people about not voting. Um, <laughs> and I don't really, I've never considered myself an activist. Um, you know, and like Kim, I love hearing about people who are activists when they were younger. I, I grew up in a really sheltered area in the Midwest, um, in Missouri, that's really, you know, not, does not show the same politics as I have, I will say that, if you know anything about Missouri. Um, and I grew up in a really kind of sheltered area um, where my parents encouraged me to vote, you know, definitely. But around me, it was just kind of like the system was already working for all the people that I was around. So they didn't really care if anybody voted or not. Um, so really, I think that, you know, the book is telling you to vote and is also just telling you that your voice is important and can be heard, even if you think that, you know, it's not important. Um, yeah, I didn't really have to think about gatekeeper. Honestly, the most feedback I got that was like gatekeeper feedback was like, cut down the cursing. <laughs> 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 Which, you know, I kind of get that feedback on a lot of my books, but it's like, we really want this book to get to like the most readers that we can, starting them as young as we can. So I know that like some middle school teachers have brought the book in, but you know, the cursing may be a bit of a deterrent for some of them. But no, I really felt like I was able to to take the book where I wanted to go. I was pretty vague um, about really, there's no candidate named, you know, I don't want to spoil the end of the book, but like, it just has, you know, if, if anyone who's read my books knows I kind of like a vague open-ended ending. And I would say that this book fits that as well. Um, so yeah, I really felt like I got to write the book that I wanted to, to write um, without feeling like I had sort of this shadow over me. My editor was great and gave me a lot of leeway. Um, and, you know, as much as the book, I think, has to say about voting and the importance of, you know, making your voice heard in politics um, to help change the world to be the one that you want to see. Um, you know, there's also, I feel like I got to be funny in this book. Like, people have called it a rom-com, which I'm happy about because mostly my books just have, like, sad romance and like, <laughs> nobody ends up happy together. Um, so it was fun to, like, get in some of that humor and also have, you know, subplots about, like, you know, Duke's band that he plays in getting to the gig and, and finding the missing internet cat. Um, so I yeah. hope that I answered both of those questions. You did. You nailed it. <laughs> and, and don't, don't let me corral your question speak about what you want, but I, you nailed it for me certainly. And, um, you know, interestingly, when you get to romance, it's true you did. And all three, uh, there's, you know, in terms of comparisons, these books are all, um, their own in every way. Uh, one piece of comparison that's interesting is the love life of the main character. There's even, there's, uh, quite a lot of complication there and, and some sort of dating outside of your experience, dating outside of your community, the complications there. That happens, I think, across all three titles, uh, which takes me to you, Kim. Um, you know, same question in some ways. Another way to answer, you know, I should have maybe done the fun version of this question, which is we're making merch for your book. We're gonna sell t-shirts, we're gonna sell a bunch of them. What is that slogan on the shirt that that uh, you know it co goes with your book. What are we trying to? What is the? What are we trying to convince? But but also, um, did you end up having to think about those gatekeepers at all? Yeah, I think with my merch, you can easily already um, go online <laughs> and buy Black Lives Matter. Um, I think that's my that's that's my that's my message. And it's interesting when you're talking about you know. Um, uh, George Orwell and art is propaganda because I think one of my um, one of my first early reviews that I had when my book was out was um, someone being really um, saying that this is act, an act, a well-known activist. I'm not well-known, guys. I'm just like a small town <laughs> girl, actually. <laughs> activist isn't even like a term, probably, that I really, you know, connect with. I'm just a person who who talks and joins clubs and organizations. Uh, but it was like a well-known activist who clearly wrote this after George Floyd's murder, which it, and this is someone in a book, in the selling books at a bookstore. Um, that you clearly don't know anything about the industry because who could possibly yeah, write fast. a book? One that fast. I'm a slow writer. I work full time. I've got two kids. I'm involved in organizations. It takes me like at least four years to write a book. So um, no, did not write it that quickly. But um, but I did. You know, I, I I started to especially around this this summer um, since the murder of um, 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 George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, um, just really. Um, wanting to be continue to be more and more unapologetic about who I am and and my voice and why I think it's important to to say Black Lives Matter. Um, you know, and I think especially in the conversation with this book and and you know the messaging that I really wanted to get out there is that um, Tracy can't vote in my story. She's under eighteen. 
Um, in our country, we look at democracy and, and people come to this country uh, as refugees and for refuge because of the freedom that we espouse to be in America, the, you know, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We the people, um, it's the voice of the people. And when you, when you don't have people who are listening to you, you use your voice in a lot of different ways. And I think that's like if I was to, you know, have a, a t-shirt that wasn't just Black Lives Matter, it would be something about life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Like that is what, um, what for Tracy in the story really wanted to do. And I wanted to open up that conversation to explain why Black Lives Matter, why it's such an issue. Um, you know, I, I was really fortunate to not have publishing uh, sort of like try to control how I told my story. I write a very complicated story. I could have easily just talked about Tracy as her father, um, you know, is is on death row. It could have just been that story. It could have just been about the story about her brother. Um, and because I, I touch on so many different themes and I just was really fortunate that I had an agent and an editor who were like, do what, do what you need to do. This is your story. Um, and and the timing of it and it coming out, I mean, it all was really connected to me and that my story needed to be told in the way that it did. Um, so I, I, I've been lucky that I haven't had to deal with, with that aspect, so. Yeah, well, I, I will say, I think on the topic of, um, you know, it, it, the topics it touches are often sparked as a conversation in our country with some horrific piece of video. Um, and I thought it was so uh, wonderful that throughout the book, um, you sort of chose to, you know, point your camera at, at Tracy, at, at the lives of the people who love, um, well, Tracy's father, obviously her whole family, but also Jamal. Um, you really sort of pointed the camera at, um, at Tracy, at what she was doing to, to fix this. I thought it was a really great way of, um, was the world, building, building empathy for, you know, all the people who are just off frame. Um, I don't know. I'm sure everything you're doing is probably purposeful, but it was a, it was nice. I thought it was a, you know, did you didn't linger on the, you know, sometimes we can get that sort of, mm -hmm. um, whatever the 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 desire to see the trauma, and in fact, we, it's it's not it's no less traumatic emotionally, but you absolutely delivered that. So, um, I think I articulated what I was trying to say. Uh, Marie, um, tell us you uh, you also have this. Um, moment, the, re the refugee uh, thing comes up. I know uh, Kim you just mentioned it as well. Um, how about you? To, to what extent were you uh, were you trying to convince? And and what what is it that, that it says? Yeah, um, I'm I'm trying to think of what the slogan it would be. It was like, towards the end of the book. There there's there's like a line that's basically like um, taking over and conquering is is easy. You know, you just you just basically like burn down everything that belongs to somebody else. Um, but, but truly annihilating, you know, annihilation is hard because, you know, people are more resilient than, than anyone gives them credit for. And, um, and so, and, and a lot of it was inspired by um, my, by my mother, like my, my mom, I hear a lot of stories from her about, you know, when she was growing up in China. Um, and I, I'm so curious to read your book, Daniel. Um, I, I, I feel like we would have Something to talk about, um, but my, like, but my mom grew up during the Cultural Revolution in China, and it was one of the darkest periods in, in China's history. Um, I think something like thirty million people died during the Cultural Revolution, and and she didn't start telling me stories about that time until I was in my thirties. Like she, she just I knew nothing about it. Just like one day she started talking, I was like, what? Oh my god! Um, but I I remember you know growing up in China and. And, um, you know, I left when I was five, but I have these memories of uh, the year 1989. And that was the year the Tiananmen Square massacre happened. My family lived in Beijing at the time, and we lived like a few blocks from the square. So we were really close to the whole thing. And um, I, I have memories of like the, the, um, the protests that were happening in the capital. And there were something like 100,000 students in that square, like every weekend for the entire first half of 1989. And it was just getting bigger and bigger. And there was happening in other cities. And, and you know, we were local. So we just kind of saw it as like a tourist attraction. I was five, so I didn't know what was happening. And so my aunt would take me there for like popsicles and stuff. It was like a nice space. And then we saw like them erect this big Statue of Liberty in the square. And they were facing off against the cops. And, and I remember like the, the morning, the day of the actual massacre, we were out there in the morning 
Um, and, um, and I remember seeing like the tanks out in the streets and they were kind of like blocking off the entrances and exits of that square. And, um, and my aunt, I remember my aunt leaning down to me and saying that it wasn't a good day to be in the square and we went home. And then the next day, I remember kindergarten was like school was canceled through all of China, I think, um, the next day. And, and then we left for America. Um, and, and we left for, you know, what, like what Kim was saying that it was, you know, you, from the outside, America, it seems like the, it's the American dream. This is where you go to, um, make things happen. This is where you can go to have your voice heard. Um, and you know, then I didn't know anything about America and that's not really the case here, but, um, but it's, it's really interesting thinking for me, thinking back on what it's like to be protesting in China and what it's like to to fight to have your voice heard in America. And I, I think a lot of the um, co comparisons and contrasts between Mara and the Federation in the book kind of go back and forth between my memories and thoughts about China, um, both back then and today, and um, my thoughts on America. So it's not like a one-to-one, -one. it's not like Mara and the Federation or China and America, but, um, but a lot of that's in there. And, and a lot of it is me thinking about um, what, you know, when you actually don't have the right to vote at all, um, when the government actually can just gun you down in the streets and there's nothing you can do about it. like, there's like, people think that it can't happen, you know, but it's as we can, as we've seen in the last four years, you backslide fast if you don't stop to do something about it. Um, and so I, I wanted to write something to show that not only is it possible for progress to happen, for us to push back against, um, you know, authoritarianism, but that, that it's, that if we don't, there's nobody else doing it. You know, there's, like the, there's no one there to catch you if you if you can't push it forward. It's like it is it is truly up to us. Um, and um, yeah, I sorry that's like not the not the ending that I was looking for, but like <laughs> <laughs> no, I, th I think you nailed that. And there's I was trying to get at. <laughs> Well, the, I think there are so many metaphors in this in this book. You know, even just having the um, having this sort of authoritarian figure constantly referring to the infinite destiny of taking everything over on the continent. There's a lot. I'm sure there are some uh, some essays to be written um, by readers on on the allegories involved. Um, well, we only have, we only have three minutes. I want to give you at least one last question, uh, maybe a minute each. And and the question is sort of, uh, you know, what didn't you write in this book? In the sense of um, what might be next, what topic might be next for you to tackle um, that that we can look forward to, um, uh, you know, in your in your writing career. Um, let me go in order uh, of the alphabet. So, uh, Brandy Colbert, do you want to do you want to tell us? Yeah, um, I was telling you all a little bit about this uh, before the panel started, but uh, I'm actually working on a nonfiction book about the Tulsa Race Massacre of 1921. Um, right now, it's tentatively due out next year, uh, which will be the 100th anniversary. Um, but, you know, that's something that's really been hidden from, you know, curriculum. Um, just last night, I was reading, as I'm starting to wrap up the book, was reading all the different uh, reasons why they think that, you know, it wasn't talked about or taught. And, you know, part of it is like, that they thought it brought shame on Tulsa. Um, you know, like the white community thought that uh, black people were scared um, and, you know, just kind of confused and just wanting to move on from it and not dwell on it. Uh, so, so many reasons why it was sort of hidden, but it's really just, I didn't know about it until probably, I don't know, within the last five to 10 years. And I grew up three hours from Tulsa and like, really, you know, kind of not, wasn't there a whole lot as a kid, but like spent a fair amount of time there. We would fly out of there sometimes. I mean, they had, you know, good uh, flights and all of that. So just to like have grown up so close to it and to not have known about it. But also I think it's things like that, that, you know, why it's so important to keep talking about voting now, um, because those kinds of things can happen and really shape the way that society grows or doesn't grow. You know, so many things were taken from the people, not just lives that were lost in the massacre, which was hundreds, you know, they estimate about 300. 
but also just the livelihoods of people who didn't feel compelled to go on, didn't feel like they had the support or literally didn't have the support after their whole families, you know, sort of homes and businesses were burned down. Um, so I just think that you can't talk about anything today without the context of history. Um, so I, I really used to think that I hated history as a kid, but it's because it was so one-sided, you know, um, and really didn't learn a lot about um, the contributions that black people made to this country, um, you know, besides building it, uh, but also just, I don't know, I think it's so important to think like Marva wants, to, like for example, with this book, The Voting Booth, Marva wants people to vote to change things um, because she knows the history that black people have had in this country. And so I think the, just the more of that history that we get out there so we can see um, that nothing happens in a vacuum, um, the more helpful it will be for everybody. Absolutely. And I was, I guess uh, I was incorrect by the way. So take your time with your answer. Uh, Kim and, and Marie, because like we got ten minutes, we can we can get into this. Oh, tell, cool. me, uh, yeah. tell me, tell me, tell uh, me, yeah. What what didn't you uh, right? Yours yours is uh, as you said before, uh, you know, an interweaving of maybe three uh, plots. It's uh, it's a uh, um, uh, but you but you stick the landing, you wrapped it all together. So what what didn't make it in there, and what maybe what's next? Yeah, I just continuing on what Brandy was sharing. I'm um, very interested in the past and the present. I wrote it in This Is My America. I'm um, having those elements where it's a timely story that's still timeless. Um, my next book that will be coming out is going to be focused on looking at the American dream. Um, it's a historical social thriller. Uh, it looks at concepts of um, power, access to power, who has access to power, uh, looks at white flight, so the suburban American dream, um, homes that were built right after World War II and who had access to them, um, Black veterans coming back from World War II and finding out that they don't have access to the American dream and what a family um, was willing to do to deconstruct the concept of race and try to live in an in a all-white community. Um, so I'm really interested in helping bridge that foundation of understanding of why our communities look the way that they do. Um, in the future, I'm very interested in, in writing a gentrification story. Um, so, you know, I'm, I, I just sort of like, I think I'm, I'm a lover of, of, of history, um, but always specifically African-American history, politics, um, sociology and law, because I think it's just so fascinating and, and a way to sort of open up the conversation that we actually don't get a chance to see why things are the way that they are today. And so I'm really, um, it's daunting writing a historical fiction, um, especially after writing something so contemporary and so in the now, but I think that, that there's just so many things that I'm even seeing today about the impact of how our communities have been redlined um, you know, genera generational wealth and the lack of generational wealth because our, you know, federal government, even looking at loans that were given out, who who actually got loans, who didn't get loans in terms of black and white communities. Um, so that's what my next book is. And I hope you'll have time to talk about authoritarianism and uh, the importance of our um, political voting aspect right now based on what, what Mary Lou was saying, because I think it's so relevant. So I'm still talking now. No, uh, one hundred percent. I'll come right back to you after Marie, and I want you to you want to deliver that one if you don't mind. That would, that would be great. I'm glad we have the extra time. Um, Marie, what about you? Um, in terms of what 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 haven't I covered yet in this one? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Dare we believe there's a, there's a Sky Hunters book too? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's a duology. So, um, I mean, I was saying that I, I want to give people some hope, and that the, <laughs> this one does have kind of a maybe not that ending, but the next one will. <laughs> so I thought it was a defiant ending, which is which is similar to hopefully. I, I liked it. I thought, and that line, as you said, the the um, annihilation versus conquering is is uh, it was was the uh, just a very powerful ethos in the book. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, I'm. I'm. Ho I'm hopeful that the next book will wrap things up um, neatly. <laughs> I. I'm about to get my first revision letter on the second one. So. So that is the the world that I'm living in, and that second one is is, is basically like the, I guess like the flip side of this one where you know, people strike back. Um, so so that's what's in my head right now, and. Um, my next project, I, I've always got like a secret side project that I'm working on um, just to kind of procrastinate on working what, on what I'm supposed to be working on. Um, and that one is pretty, like you couldn't have a more opposite book. That one is basically like, I just wanted to have fun. So um, like when Brandy was talking about 
how you like to write um, the humor and the, the the romantic comedy in the voting booth. I was like, oh, that is exactly where I am right now. I just want to write something like fun and romantic and 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 actiony. So so that's a little bit of what I'm working on right now, and it's kind of been my like candy on the side, uh, and I've been having fun with it. So so hopefully I'll get to talk about it more. Um, at some other time. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Uh, okay, Kim, the, uh, take me away. What do you, what, uh, about authoritarianism? Uh, and and I, didn't, I didn't catch the second part of it. So, uh, yeah, I more. think, yeah. you know, I think, I think the past several years, we've seen what uh, power uh, at our highest level, um, accessing of you know, changing our laws uh, to the benefit of those that are in power and at our, you know, top 1% of our country. And that's why, you know, thinking specifically about this, this particular panel, why it's so important that we are the ones who can keep our country upholding it to what we espouse to be. Um, you know, if we think about Sky Hunter 5,000 years from now, um, you know, that we, what, what life do we actually want to see in our future? And do we want to actually go backwards? And, you know, I think we are the only ones that can um, use our voice and fight for what we believe in. Um, you know, we don't have a lot of power, but we do have our voice. Um, we can, you know, push our legislators, you know, our representatives um, to, you know, that we won't vote for them, uh, you know, that we'll, we might run against them. Uh, if they don't actually um, represent us as people. And so I just wanted, you know, because we're in this sort of political world and we have recent news um, about access to, who has access to the best healthcare, um, even when they use our lives recklessly uh, and look at us recklessly, is that we are the only ones who actually can fight for ourselves. And I think this is the time that we don't get lazy. Um, we're in a very critical 30 days uh, right now. It'll be critical post 30 days, but I think we're in our most uh, critical 30 days of our country and that will actually impact impact our lives. I think we often say voting like it'll impact your life, but I think that there's no other time in our country right, right now, the decisions that we make will actually literally impact the health, safety and wellness of us. So please go vote. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I couldn't agree more. I got mine. Uh, I got mine today, believe it or not. I was excited. My, my little, you know, envelope. Um, all right. Well, tell me, Kim. I'm, I'm sorry, Brandy. Uh, did I did I miss a signal from you? Oh, okay. No, no. I was just clapping for. Oh, I see. You got your voting okay. ballot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I looked down. Uh, Brandy, yours is the most about voting. Of course, it is that it is one day? I, you know, uh, 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 voting day. Of course, um, I won't. I won't ruin it because. Uh, you know, there's there is a there is sort of a build up to to the um, election and what what it is. But um, you know, to what extent were you thinking about that? I know earlier you had sort of said it is set in for you in your head um, in one particular place. But you you did a great job of keeping it um, uh, fairly neutral, fairly broad. I mean, I felt like I could read it in my head. I was trying to be like, is this 2016? Is this 2020? What you know? Would uh, tell me? Was it, obviously it was purposeful. you you know you knew what you were up to. Um, Tell me a little bit about that. Were you imagining 16, 20 was in a particular moment? Yeah, I don't know if I was actually, I don't know if I was actually even pre like picturing a year. I mean, I kind of assumed 2020 just because I knew the book was coming out in 2020 and, you know, they're voting in a presidential election. But like you said, there's no real details there. Um, you know, I said the book that I'm, that I feel the voting booth is in conversation with is yes, no, maybe so. Um, and, you know, they do get into like the candidate and all of that. And I think that's really useful because it sort of brings you closer to the characters. With this, um, you know, just talking to my editor about how we wanted to frame it, um, you know, after I turned in the first draft, I was a little more specific with things, like I had an ideal um, setting for it and all of that. And she let me keep a lot of the things in that I had, but she was like, let's sort of scale back. Um, so it reads a little broader, I think, so it feels more accessible to everyone who reads it. So, you know, there's already so much divisiveness. And so, if someone is reading this, assuming it's, you know, if they're in a blue state and they're assuming it's in a red state, they might automatically just sort of turn off, let's we'll stop listening because it's like, well, that doesn't apply to me. And we really didn't want that to be the case. We wanted it to really the point of it to be about voting, no matter what you believe, you know, again, you sort of, you get with the main characters, you know, what they, what they believe in, you know, they believe in gun control, um, you know, they believe in fighting climate change, 
So you sort of know what side they're on, but really the most important thing for them is just to get out there and vote and just, you know, make sure that you can make your voice heard and, and it's your civic duty, <laughs> you know, basically like there's this one thing that you have to do every couple of years, just go do it, you know, read up on the candidates, read up on what they're doing and go do it. And so we see that with Marva and Duke where Marva is just like super determined. She knows all of the ballot. She knows everything that's on the ballot and everything. And Duke is just doing it as more of like, you know, in service to his um, late activist brother. Um, so yeah, like their stories are very specific, but really wanted the overall feel of it to be that this could be anybody, you know, that any team can see themselves in Marva and Duke and understand the importance of what they're really setting out to do in the book. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Thomas, for that. Um, I, uh, you know, it's interesting, You as you go and you as are expressing yourselves these, there is, there's so many ways of engagement. Uh, by the time we get to you, Marie, uh, it's, you just, you gotta put up, you gotta put some boots to, to faces is what's going on. Um, so, uh, <laughs> do you want to tell us, uh, you know, I found it really fascinating. And by the way, uh, I think, I think we just got our warning. So I do, I do need to sign us off. Um, thank you for each of you, uh, speaking to us about your wonderful books, please. Uh, uh, audience, check it out. Go, go make the click, pick out the book, but, um, we're going to go maybe go off stage. Gets each of us are going to pull out a drink, and we're going to talk about the you know the 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 nature of uh, the love lives of these characters. We're going to get into it. It's going to be Brooklyn Book Festival after dark.